I know of a girl who was teaching English in Moldova and uh, at one point noticed that two of her students had disappeared, a boy and a girl, brother and sister. And most of the people didn't really question to ask what had happened, even though she asked the family and they really didn't have a response. People were just used to carrying on with their lives. And because she knew that so many Moldovan children are at risk of being trafficked, she looked harder into what had happened. And in fact, the children's family had sold them into slavery. Directors and workers at orphanages have cooperated with traffickers as well and sold orphans. There are also the so-called pretty boys who romance young women. Soon after sweeping them off their feet, they invite them for a weekend out of the country and then they sell their unsuspecting girlfriend to traffickers. Marriage brokers are also in on the action, selling trusted brides abroad to traffickers. So many teenagers are simply abducted off the streets while walking home from school. There are cases of US and Canadian citizens being trafficked abroad, though at a much lower rate. There have been girls who have won fake contests, modeling contests, and gone abroad to be trafficked, or people who have simply just gone into the wrong hands when they're traveling abroad. An example of this was actually recently shown in the movie Trade, which is still in theaters, and I encourage everyone to see it. Canada and the US are more commonly destination countries in the trafficking network. Again, this might be hard to believe that there are trafficking victims working blocks away from us. But another recent example actually was uh, just north of Barrie. If anybody has a cottage near Midland, uh, a trafficking group was just broken up who had over 10 Filipino labor workers working near Elmvale and crammed into a small farmhouse, being paid nothing and only fed enough to keep them alive. Of course, nobody's been charged, and this is a common way that Canada likes to deal with the traffickers, but we'll get more into that a little bit later. Next to uh, Vancouver's massage parlors and the back rooms of Toronto strip clubs that are filled with foreign women, our youth serve as a source to meet the demand for commercial sex. We've only recently come to realize the extent to which our streets are filled with prostituted minors. These are mostly runaways who undergo a very different recruiting process than foreign women and girls do. While I don't have time to get fully into this today, I would be happy to speak about domestic trafficking to anybody who's interested. Uh, I guess later, you can contact me. <laughs> the major question that many of us are wondering right now is why and how is such a horrible crime happening? on such a large scale? Well, as the third largest industry in the world, you can imagine the profits. Money motivates the traffickers to exploit people. Money motivates many of the victims to take risks. Money is even a factor when John's search for cheaper sex, inevitably leading them to an illegal source where people are being exploited. A note about selling people for labor or for sex is that it's very different than selling a drug or a, a one-time use commodity. When you have a drug and you sell it, you use it once and it's gone. But when you buy a person, you can use that person over and over again. You make back the money you invested in getting them in less than a day. Traffickers can purchase a woman for as little as $50, or simply kidnap someone, and then sell and resell her body, making up to $5,000 a day on that one person. But the driving force in the entire global sex trade is the buyers of sex. They are the demand side of the equation. It's simple economics. If there wasn't a buyer, there wouldn't be a seller, and there wouldn't be a victim. When you look at it this way, you cannot escape the conclusion that this entire tragedy is totally man-made. Pimps and brothel owners would not go through the trouble of enslaving a person if they aren't absolutely certain that somebody will come to pay money for them. Ma uh, Malaric also addresses uh, in his new book, <coughs> John's, this issue coming out in March. Also in his research, he hits on the fuse that ignited the worldwide explosion of the sex trade, the internet. With the, with the click of a mouse, buyers can find exactly what they are looking for in the privacy of their own homes. They can find the exact location of brothels in virtually every city on the globe. They post photographs of their victims. Traffickers sell images. And seriously, of the endless stream of pornographic images online, how many of them do you really think were produced by legitimate companies? How many of these young faces do you really think belong to employees of the porn industry who have workers' rights? Might I add that one in five pornographic images found on the internet is of a child? 
The record for, pun for punishing traffickers and johns is embarrassingly low for many reasons. Partly because human trafficking is a new phenomenon and the ju judiciary is cautious in approaching these cases. And of course, we can't forget about government complacency and corruption. Much of the blame must be laid at the doorsteps of governments and law enforcers who tolerate or turn a blind eye to what is going on or participate as traffickers themselves. No sooner do victims enter the streets that they encounter the biggest hurdle of indifference, the police. They learn quickly that the police officer not only cares little about them, but can even be the enemy. Unbelievable corruption facilitates this brutal, tra this brutal trade. Trafficking could not exist to the extent that it does without it. Even if police are not involved in the traffic and are working against prostitution, they are often ignorant about the situation of prostituted women and girls. Believe it or not, but there are situations where victims turn to their pimps in protection from the police. Clearly, traffickers are facing far fewer obstacles than you would think. So you would wonder why there isn't an all-out war to stop the traffic. A number of laws have been introduced to address human trafficking, the most important of which, the U of which is the UN protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons. This was introduced in 2000. The same year, the U.S. enacted the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which led to the creation of the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons. Each year, they publish the TIP report, which assesses individual countries and grades them based on their efforts to combat the problem. There is a long list of anti-trafficking organizations in the U.S. and in Canada, and it's growing each year. In the U.S., there is Free the Slaves, Shared Hope International, the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, and in Canada, we have the RCMP, the Interdepartmental Working Group on Trafficking in Persons, the Future Group, and of course, all the groups that make up Stop the Trafficking Coalition. Help Us Help the Children, a project of Children of Chernobyl Canadian Fund, joined the battle when it became clear how many orphans in Ukraine are, end up being trafficked. We've been helping orphans over the past 15 years with medical supplies and educational materials and host leadership camps every summer and winter. But the decision was made to expand this focus of our activities with the creation of the Anti-Trafficking Initiative, or ATI. Our projects have included raising awareness both in Canada, the US, and Ukraine, anti-trafficking and job search workshops for orphans, and the distribution of educational materials. Each year, Help Us Help the Children provides hundreds of orphans with a survival handbook called Work Abroad or Robotiza Kodamam, which includes trafficking traps and hotlines worldwide. Last year, ATI received a CETA grant and created HTAP, or Human Trafficking Awareness Project. I was given the opportunity to partner with Melania Privetkevich in coordinating the project in Tanopol, Ukraine. This project involved raising awareness among high school students and orphans through interactive workshops. HTAP was a great success and an important learning experience. We found that while there is a general awareness of what human trafficking is, there, is still strong, there are strong attitudes that prevent it from being dealt with properly. Most of the students had an attitude that they would never become victims, despite the fact that they were unable to list any recruitment tactics by traffickers and any checks that you really need to make when you're going abroad. And this was extremely troublesome, given the fact that over 